beyond traditional testing, exploring diverse engineering techniques to evolve your mobile QA strategy. So today's event is organized by the Quality Forum of SPASCOM and our first speaker for the evening is Mr. Anjana Soma Tilaka. Uh, he is a Director Engineering and Architecture of LeapSet. Uh, he has over 12 years of experience designing and developing software for multinational organizations in the USA and UK, possessing a proven track record of working with large global teams to deliver scalable enterprise solutions. He, is also, he was a software architect at Virtusa and head of the engineering department at uh, CyberLMJ. In computing and information systems from University of London, he has a graduate degree and also a MSc in IT from SLIP. So I'd like to invite you to uh, take it up. Thank you. Right. Uh, you guys can hear me here. Before we begin, uh, let's look at what the audience is. People who are in uh, quality assurance, please raise your hand. Anyone who's not in quality assurance, product managers, project managers, techies. All right, okay. So majority is quality assurance professionals. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So let's start with the topic. Uh, <coughs> The whole theme is not something uh, new. Uh, we've been talking about this theme in, in multiple instances, in multiple uh, developer conferences, and this is the first time we're talking this in a QA specific conference. Traditional testing. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is not a replacement for traditional testing. It stays as is. And these are few techniques you can enhance, evolve your QA strategy, but not uh, replacement for your traditional testing. So I start with the question. Traditional testing ends when the app goes live. We're talking about mobile apps. The whole context is mobile today. Uh, <coughs> In any other development, in other disciplines, you build a software, you deploy that to a production server. After that, you start monitoring your application. You start monitoring your uh, web server, a database server. But how often in mobile applications, once we, once we push the app to an app store, be it Google or Apple, we start looking at things. We simply forget the app after pushing that thing. So I take that as a boundary uh, in traditional testing. And this whole discussion is how we go beyond that. How we go beyond that level and improve quality in an application. Here in this context, when I say app, I'm talking about a mobile app. I'm not going to prefix everything with mobile. So most of the things that I'm going to talk about should be prefixed with mobile. When we do this, so. Do you guys agree? Do you guys, when you publish your mobile app, you uh, put it into App Store? Do you actually worry about that after that? Do you test that? Oh, you're done. You say, all gone. How many of you individually or in organizations monitor and test your apps once you publish your App Store? If you do so, please press your hand. Okay, I see a few people. All right. Alright, so the rest of the crowd, do you think, is that something we need to do uh, in order to measure quality, uh, in order to make that more stable? Do you agree? If you agree, please raise your hand. Okay, so there are quite a few disagreements. Alright, let's, let's move on. Let's see how uh, best we can understand this. So if, if this is correct, <coughs> what actually happens, is this. <clears throat> in production mode, you run your mobile app blindly. You know nothing. You don't know who is downloading this, who is doing what on this particular app. Whether people are using the app or whether people are not using is again something that you don't know. The case that you are trying to build 
uh, and what we try to preach and get it to you is if you want your app to be much stable and uh, highly usable, you need to go this extra step. All right, so I, I have a <coughs> story behind this talk. Uh, this is based on personal experience. This is based on an app that we uh, worked on. Uh, the story is, we built an app and we functionally tested that app. 100% functionality tested, 100% in terms of, from the known test cases, it was fully functional. Whatever the defects that were reported, we put effort and fixed. No known defects. It can be unknown defects, but if we don't know a defect, then we can't fix it. So there were no known defects. No customer complaints. Now the app is published. There were no customer complaints yet. <coughs> All good. How many of you have been in situations like this where you put a lot of effort, effort test, put it to App Store, and for the next couple of days you don't see any problems? You think, okay, they're all good. Then comes what we call uh, most highly used four keywords in the mobile world no customer satisfaction for no reason. App abandonment, people uh, leave your app and go. Four louds. Users do not use this app anymore. People literally uninstall your app from their mobile phones. It is that bad for some reason. And the worst case is, we don't know why. We developed it, we unit tested, code review, functional tested, and we don't know why people don't like it. Now what to do? Anyone in the, in this forum can can anyone suggest? Have you guys been in a situation like this? Anyone who's been in a situation like this? No. Okay. You as a quality assurance professional, QA professional, what would what could you suggest in a situation like this? What can you do? This is what we did. I'm not saying this is the only way to go about it, but this is what we did. Then, after all the failures, we listen to the customer. Question is, how to listen to customers? If it's a web application, you pretty much know your customer base. If it's when it's a mobile app. Once you publish, anyone in the world can download it, use it. Your user base is highly diverse. You don't know who's using your application, who's not using your application. The type of the types of users, their capacities, IQ levels, you pretty much don't know your customers. And one part of building successful products is to know your customer base. You need to know your customer base. Study them and then give your application. But in this context, maybe it's a it's a uh, realization. Uh, it's a late realization. However, you don't know your customer. So what can you do? Can you do a customer satisfaction survey? Do you guys think that's a good idea? I don't know. It's very hard because your customers are, your users are highly distributed. Ask for QA feedback. This is something I do continuously. I go to my QA deals and ask, what do you guys think? You guys are the, pretty much the closest to a user I have in, in this office. How do you feel? Do you like it? Are there any usability things that, you know, other than your test cases, are there anything that you guys suggest? Most of the time, uh, most of the time I'm not happy with what I do. Most of the time, that doesn't mean that every way in the not have opinion. Well, for some reason, QA feedback has become very mechanical. They're like, 
100 test cases, we executed all 100 test cases, 75 passed, 25 failed. What does that mean to me? Right? How do you put that in a context of feedback, from a user feedback? It's very hard to get. Right? You guys probably understand when I say it's very hard to get. When we work with your own engineers, it's really hard to get. Hire a domain expert, someone who knows about this domain. Is that a feasible option? Maybe and maybe not. Some products that you build, some products that we build, and when we publish, <coughs> we might be the first people to build them. And the, the only domain experts are maybe us. Yes, but no one else. What we did, we used a very old technique called spying in a legalized way. We used analytics and crash reports. This whole talk is based on these two simple things. Based on our learning, we were in a situation, we were helpless. We actually did not know what was the reason behind for this app not to be successful. That's a very hard state to be. We as engineers, engineering staff, we put things logically. Uh, when we add two things, it sums up. It sounds very logical to us. But in situations like this, put us to a situation we don't know what to do. That's where the challenge and this is how we overcome the challenge. Uh, my focus of this tech talk is not to teach or a specific tool like uh, analytics platform or a crash reporting platforms. Rather introduce the concept to you, you guys in a very lightweight manner. I'm not going to go into pretty detail, I'm going to keep it very light. Uh, but your take home should be much wider and you should be able to start your research, start your own uh, research and see whether you can adapt these in your app from tomorrow itself. That's my answer. Why analytics? <coughs> Customers don't give you feedback until it is very late. Some apps, they just go, pop, they go viral and they become popular. Some, they don't. <coughs> There's no scientific reason between why Angry Birds is so popular and why there are so many other games which are much cooler are not so popular. Some people might say it's so simple, some might say it has physics in it, but there's no one justification. If that's the case, people would continually, continuously build apps on the same nature. People who build this Angry Bird, they have lots of other apps which are not popular. So it's very hard thing to understand what makes it so good. This is a key. We all know this. Experimentation and optimization. You have to keep doing it. You have to keep doing this if you need an app or a, uh, a product to be successful. Version 1, getting version 1 out is just a milestone. The real work starts once you get your version 1 out. Version 1 is just to say you proved your concept. You need to be used. Your concept is out there. But getting customers, retaining customers, being profitable is a bigger or bigger challenge which we don't have a single theory that could define. Alright, so what are the platforms we have to do analytics? There are lots of Google Analytics came up with a very nice mobile analytics platform. Uh, Mixpanel is quite popular. App Addy, App Boy, you know. There are quite a few. I just named a few here so that you can do your homework when you do that. Let's see in a nutshell how it works. When we talk about mobile analytics, what are we really talking about? Everyone understand uh, keywords like app, an application has a backend which has an API 
at the back end. Most probably have a database. You know, those concepts are clear to app talks to API, which is your back end. Back end has data storage and other stuff. So what we try to do here, the, the key the keywords are action or events. When you take an application, that application has a bunch of events. Sign in to the application is one such event. I mean, you guys know events much more than me because QA is pretty much associated with those steps. When a particular user performs an event, that event has a bunch of other data elements. Name of the user, age of the user, gender, whether a female user or a male user, things like that. Those are the properties of that particular event that we capture. Within the application, we capture what are the events that is being performed and pertaining to that, related to that event, what are the properties in that context based on the user, based on where this user is based on. You collect a bunch of properties. So when you go to that, I, have, I think I have another <coughs> section where it explains event versus properties. This is quite fundamental to mobile analytics. What we simply do, we collect these events and their properties, and from the mobile app, we keep sending them to a central server. This central server is not your backend. It doesn't have to be your backend. The backend is where you have an API exposed with the functionality of the mobile app, backend functionality. It's not there. It could be that, but if you go for a third party service, like what I showed before, it goes to a different server. Events, as and when those are performed, that data gets trained to a central server. That's your analytical backend, and that backend comes with analytical dashboards where you can go and see things. That's we will see that in a bit. So what I just explained in a in, in three steps. <clears throat> How do you do this? You download a library called SDK, right? If you go to mobile analytics, uh, Google Analytics, or Mixpanel, and so and so, they probably have something called a client SDK software. Right. <clears throat> Integrate that, bring that, put that into your code base, connect. Uh, I'll show a slight code sample, you get an idea of it. So there is a SDK, there is a library, or this piece of code in your application, alien piece of code, which you borrowed from someone else. And from your application, as and when you do events, you talk to this library and say, record this, collect this. And that piece of code is responsible to send that information to a central server. So you don't have to worry about network sending those code that is taken care of. But within your application, you need to record your events. You are the one who define your events. You are the one who define the properties of that event. Because, uh, so for instance, add to car is a event. And when you are adding something to car, this is an application where you buy things like add to shopping car. What are the properties you need to analyze? It all depends on you. Finally, you go to a dashboard, analyze the data that you sent from multiple devices. Any questions so far? Uh, you guys with me, you guys follow what I'm talking? Quick question. <clears throat> Can we get the user's passwords and stuff in the mobile phone via this platform? <laughs> send it to a central server and do stuff? It's illegal. Don't, don't try to do that. This is at a very high level, how you do, you bring mixed panel, um, don't, don't worry about the code. You say create object called mixed panel and track this event called add to cart. Under that, properties capture gender and plan. Gender is female in this case, plan is premium. Uh, it's a little funny, this is object you see, object you see, with every string starts with answer. No logical explanation, but it is the way it is. Uh, so you, you should not read gender at female, it's gender. Uh, female is just a string. 
and you say that. <coughs> so in this case, you are recording all add to cart events with the properties of gender and the plan that they are. So people can be on gold, silver, premium, and different plans right, based on the product that you sell. So you capture those two. Make sense? Now let me ask you a question. I was trying to explain this to another group and one guy asked me a simple question. Why can't you simply get this information from your database itself? You have an application that talks to your API and, and it writes data to your backend database. Why can't you get all that information? You could, but in most of the cases when we design our data set in the database, we store data which is needed to do calculations right? or to show it in reports. We might not store all the data. Now probably these two properties we should have <coughs> back in our database. But there can be other parameters like how long this user has been using this application. Which is not something that you store in your database. Right? How, how many minutes this user took before sending this event to the server, the session time. Those does not really matter to your database. So because of that, you don't have those in your data. So you create those properties. But the best part is when you do this, you have an analytical dashboard and your application which are separate. So you can let uh, different people analyze your data without exposing your database and the APIs. All right, this is how you do it. You collect data, events, property, events and their properties. So events are like launch to launch app, add to cart, submit order, when you are submitting an order. Some of the properties, for example, name, name of the merchant, session time that we talked about, how many minutes the user being, you know, struggling in this, playing around, playing in this particular activity before uh, submit the order, things like that. If you, and you collect that, then you analyze. Theory of data analysis is you need to torture your data. You need to put your door, what the data guys say, massage your data, put it in different formats, and see whether it makes sense, whether your data makes, whether your data tells you some secrets about how the users are using this app, how the why why users are falling down. Then the most important thing is you need to act. What does that mean? We realized in one of our applications, the default values, uh, we had a very simple feature in one of our applications, a tip calculator. You go to a restaurant, you get the bill, now you need to calculate the tip, 10%, uh, 15%. And if there are three guys, or far off, group of five, how do you divide this tip? Because Bill maybe $161, 15% of that is some amount. And if there are three guys, how do you divide the tip to three equal pieces? Or something like that. So our default number was two. We thought, you know, most probably two people go and that's where they stay. But when we look at data, the default value should have been ideally three. Because when we looked at data, we looked at uh, what the user changes that the default value do. The next version, we change it from two to three, but there were more than 10, 15 users who have simply mentioned that, you know, app has learned and that has uh, changed this, and we got some noise. These tiny changes could take your app a long way. Remove unused buttons, <coughs> unused workflows, and make your app highly usable. But be Cautious about doing these changes, uh, you need to have a good sample size and also you need to analyze your data for a valid period. Right? What we have learned, unlike in, uh, I think it, it's even it, it's the actual language. There are seasons, in those particular seasons, people behave change drastically. How they eat, what they order. So if you simply analyze data of a such a season, like the season in Sri Lanka, people buy whatever the clothes that they can find. 
but that doesn't. So if you analyze out of the season and try to get close to your shop in maybe you know after that in May or something, that might not be a right strategy. So you probably have to look at data for a longer period of time and then make your decision. Make sense? All right. Now let's look at. So we know how to collect data. The library will take that data to a central server, and then you sort of play around with that data to make make decisions. Now I'm going to talk about playing around with this data. What can you do? What kind of reports are we looking? At? I'm going to show you very simple three reports. It doesn't mean these platforms are capable of showing only those three kind of reports. It can show a lot more. But I just want to give you very simple three reports. Number one is called segmentation. The question is, I have a game, and in my game I have levels and people playing that game. But I need to understand, based on the level, like level one, level two, level three of a game, how much people do score. An analytical tool would tell you that your x-axis is the uh, the level 0 to 10, 10 to 20, then your y is the, the score. This seems like a game where you score a lot. So you segment your user groups in one way. And you can make it complicated, or you can make, make, make uh, other dimensions, you can bring different time periods, you can filter it by the properties of your users, female, male, above 16, below 16, you know. You can bring all that to segmentation. And then you segment your market. So relate that back to a uh, comment that I made, that we do not know our customers when we build a mobile app. This is how you understand your customer. You segment them. It's easy to study when you segment them than study your whole customer. Another important thing, funnel. Measure how customers move through a series of events. The very first event is launching that. Then what they do, what they do. What is your ultimate goal in your app? Is something that you need to define. Uh, we are in a restaurant domain. Ultimate goal for us is placing an order. When people place an order, it, money goes to the restaurant and we get a cut. So ultimate goal for us is to encourage users to place orders so that we get our right? So how many people, this is extremely simplified solution. How many people visit your home page? Out of that, how many do search rooms? So this is something like a booking, hotel booking system. Out of the people who search rooms, how many are actually placing uh, booking hotels? So your completion rate here is 43%. Now, what does this completion ratio mean to you? Is 43% a good number or a bad number? It totally depends on your business. There's no global rule saying 43 is good or 43 is bad. Based on your business, this is either good or bad. But from a quality assurance perspective, these are the feedback that you need to do. I think there is some difficulty for people to place or uh, uh, book uh, rooms. That is why uh, 600,000 to, oh, sorry, 600 something to 400 something. That, that is why 200 people are not uh, placing orders. It's, it, may be, it may be because they simply don't want the application. That now you need to go into details and figure out whether it's whether it's natural or whether it's something you have injected, whether it's a quality of your application that drives people away from this object. <coughs> another the tool, another uh, report. How to find if your customers value your application? How to how to find whether they come back to your application? Without this report, for me, it's impossible. This report tells you. Show, look at the, the original title. So we are relating two events. 
show me people who signed up that's the very first event and then book the flight people who joined your app and then place an order kind of thing. first month 33% second one month uh, 31% 28% 30 23% and reading the first row so you see your retention at any time so this gives you some indication whether people are coming back or not uh, this is highly practiced in marketing campaigns people who got the email of this particular marketing campaign how many times they bought the product so you can figure out whether your marketing campaign was successful or not so retention is such graph that gives you a very clear picture whether people come back to it after one month, two months, three months, and four months, and so on. So these are real powerful information if you define your events properly. That gives you feedback of whether people, whether your users like you app or whether they just use one time and fall out. All right, so that's pretty much the concept of uh, mobile analytics in a nutshell. Now I'm trying to change gears and go to another uh, topic. If you have any questions, any comments, this is the time to talk. When a flight or a plane crashes, how do you figure out what was the cause? What do you look for? Black box. Uh, surprisingly, all the black boxes that I have seen in internet images are in red color. <laughs> so, and what does that have in real life? Something called a crash report. A report of events of what happened and how that crash happened. When a web server crashes, if you get to your support guy or a developer, what's the first thing that developer uh, support guy or even the QA as QA engineer, so QA professional, what do you do? You go to your you log into your web server, go to EDC log files, folder or whatever the block folder that you have defined go to the most recent log, open the log and see what the exception but when your mobile lab crashes why don't you do that? what do you do? you probably say, uh, you know launch the app again, it will probably work we don't do that but that's a good practice, we have it in the airline industry we have it in our standard uh, software development in the web server kind of environment but in mobile, nobody talks about the error line, the crash phone, which is actually there in the phone. If you plug it to a USB cable, you can get it. But now your user is not here, probably in Canada or in Arab, but you simply can't get that lock. You, can't, you don't have a, such a long USB cable to plug that in. So how do we get that and analyze it? All right, even uh, crash reporting, I have a small uh, scenario to explain. You spend a week testing your app. This is functional testing that when I talk about this. Published to the App Store, all good. Positive reviews, you know, one or two positive reviews, and if you really go and see, first people to do positive reviews are your QA team itself, and then your product manager, then the CEO of the company, then some of your friends, maybe your spouses, they make positive reviews. Then stop. Then you see actual users making some comments and reviews. Until one user post a one star review, because there's nothing lower than one star. One star is the worst review that you can make. Saying the worst thing possible, the application crashed. So this is what you call a production defect. Right? If this happens on a web server, a big scene, a production defect, we need to have a production. Uh, nothing is worse than hearing about crashes from the user community. You really don't want your users to say, hey, this app is crashing. However, we developers and you guys in the uh, uh, professionals, we have a very good excuse in the mobile world. It's not just a single server that you can monitor. There are thousands of devices, operating systems, highly volatile environment can crash any time. And if you look at the Android operating system, the operating system 
itself is designed in a such a way when there are new apps, when there are apps in foreground, uh, when there are new apps that you keep loading, apps in the background, they kill it. Right? So that is why the Android apps are being developed in a life cycle. What does a life cycle mean? You die at some point. So that is why Android has a life cycle. So if, you are, if someone kills your app, operating system, app can come back and continue from where it is. That's why we don't write one method for Android. Life cycle is used. So operating system itself is killing your app. So in this situation, if, if it does such thing, app getting crashed is quite normal behavior. So we have excuse for it. We didn't test it on iPhone 6. We didn't test it on uh, HTC, Desire 1. We tested on Samsung Galaxy S4. Well, S4, it works perfectly fine. And that's true. App doesn't crash on S4. It crashes on some Chinese version of XMYYDRW. We don't have them. We have not even seen them. Solution. Integrating crash reports in your app gives you info to fix the issues, not to prevent the issues, right? App crashes are like accidents, they just happen. But if you have crash reporting, it's all about how you react, how you fix it, so that it won't happen again. We all know when we buy a brand new car, someday, one day, a buffer is going to get scratched. But we don't put that in a box and keep it home, right? You put it in the road, you go to peta in it, you go to down south in it, you do all the stuff with it. You take a risk. However, you have a mechanism to cover if something goes wrong. Insurance policy. This is something similar to that, where if something goes wrong, you get to know what happened, and you can fix it so that it won't happen again. Are we good so far? Are you guys with me? Do you follow what I'm saying? Good. Crash reporting platforms, crash tickets. Main Google Analytics supports crash reports. There are so many other solutions. I'm not going to talk about any specific solution. I'm going to talk about in general what do the, these uh, platforms offer and how does it work. How it works? Very simple. This is a crash. Sorry. And if this happens, I, I'm pretty sure all of you are very unhappy in Facebook crash. So let's understand this crash reporting from a two perspective, from two perspectives, from a local perspective and distributed perspective. If the developer detects this kind of a crash in his coding environment, what we call the IDE, this is how it looks like. <coughs> you have the code, you have the error message down under. On your left side, you have something called a stack. Tricks. You know, what method you call, what that method called, and you know, that. And this is the error, the way the developer sees it. What does the developer see? Uh, expecting, the, uh, expecting the Boolean value, however, the actual value is NS null. So, unrecognized selector, blah, blah, blah. That's the reason. So, null has not been handled. Instead of a Boolean value, you get a null value, you have crashed. That's how, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the uh, iOS object you see works. You don't put a lot of constraints to do lots of checks because then that makes your app very heavy. You keep your app ultra lightweight and the slightest thing can crash your app. But it gives you much performance. Think about it, right? How powerful is your computer and compare to that? What do you have in your phone? But you can do pretty much everything that you do in your computer, in your phone. Edit your Word docs, your emails, all that is done. How do apps run on a very limited hardware, keeping things really like it? That's one reason apps crash it. Because they are built on complicated environments with limited hardware and limited uh, frameworks as well. So this is the local view. Now let's imagine the same error happens while a user is using your application. Right? We can't go to the user. The user, he or she is somewhere else. But we like to see what that error is. If you have crash reporting integrated, 
this is what you see. You log in to a central server. Right hand top corner, three crashes. This has happened three times. How many users been impacted? Three users. Uh, top red box that which I have highlighted, it talks about the, the class name, method, and the second one that talks about the same error. The NS null boolean value, I don't know whether that's very clear to you, but it highlights it in a central server. Information comes from the mobile phone to this. Okay. Can I ask you a question? If your app crashes, how can the app how is it possible for the app to send this crash log to the central server? Because this is to say when I die, I will kill you. Fun, dead I can't do it. If your app is not dead. How does a dead app send its own error report to a central server? Delius, it doesn't send it when it is dead. It sends it in its next lifespan, when you launch that next time. Not in this lifespan, in the next life, it will send that. So, if, I, if user get mad and delete the app after the crash, you don't get your crash. If the user is patient enough to relaunch it, highly likely you get that crash. All right. Uh, another product which shows a bunch of errors, the number of times these errors happen, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the time and uh, time period, the number of times that happen. And one more thing I think I forgot to mention about it. Here, they show you some little bit extra information at the middle, the type of device, whether the device is jail broken, right? So iPhone developers certify their apps if the app, if the phone is not jail broken. If you jailbreak your app, your behavior is not correct. So you cannot certify your mobile app on a jail broken phone. You don't know what, how what it is. Because there are no updates, nothing works after that. Uh, it's real, really wild when you change it. How much free space this phone had? How much free RAM this phone had? Whether the app in focus was 100%? Whether the proximity is on or not? So some of these values also gives you idea. If the RAM usage was very high, you can guess this was due to the RAM usage. Of it. So it's nothing to do with your coding, but it was the app itself. All right, so we come to the end. Take home, include analytics and crash reporting in your QA strategy. This will comprehend your QA strategy once the app is live and you get to monitor your app. Uh, and you get to monitor your app with your real devices, with real users, and that will add value also. Crash reporting and analytics is something that we use from day one before it even goes to uh, end users. Where you can measure your beta testing, you can test your uh, individual QA's performance, all that with this because it all gets recorded. All right, thank you very much, guys. <laughs>